Good afternoon and welcome to Practical Web Cache Poisoning. Have you ever been working away and just noticed something that wasn't quite right and thought, that's strange, but that's rather complex. I think I'll just deal with that later on when I have more free time. For years, web cache poisoning has been a vulnerability that people didn't want to think about. It's existed mostly as one of these theoretical vulnerabilities that are more often used to scare people than actually proven to exist. And for years, I lived in fear of web cache poisoning and its notorious complexity, but I recently found myself in a situation where I had no choice but to try it and discovered that actually, web cache poisoning is wonderful. So today, in this session, I'm gonna share with you practical tools and techniques to detect, explore, and exploit web cache poisoning. I don't normally share the story of how I got started on research because it's generally pretty dry, but this one time, I'm gonna make an exception. I started out about a year ago with a simple plan and a lot of optimism. I wrote this tool to find hidden query parameters called ParamMiner. And my plan was, I was gonna run this tool on lots of sites, it would find some really cool weird parameters, I'd find some awesome bugs in those, and I'd give a talk about that. And it started off quite well, I found some quite remarkable query parameters, uh, like this one here. <laughs> but the next step just went horribly wrong. The most interesting thing I could find in these query parameters that was actually serious over and over was boring old reflected cross-site scripting, which is not something that I really wanna give a talk about. And so I thought, okay, well, this hasn't worked out, but maybe all the cool vulnerabilities are actually hiding in cookies. So I hacked up my code to guess cookie names as well, set it running, and found something that looked super promising. And about eight hours later, I got absolutely nowhere and had to admit, actually, that was a waste of time as well. And at this stage, I only really had one option left, which was to once again hack up the code, and this time make it guess HTTP headers. So I did this, and I set out guessing headers and found loads of weird and wonderful headers. And yet, once again in these headers, I found nothing but cross-site scripting, which I was pretty sick of at this point. And cross-site scripting in headers is even less interesting than normal reflected XSS because there's no way for me to make someone else's browser send a header across the main. There was only one tiny glimmer of hope, which was that some of, some of these servers that had XSS in their headers used caching and just maybe I could use their caches as an exploit delivery mechanism for my header-based XSS. So I tried this as an absolute last resort, and quite surprisingly, it actually worked. So first, I'm gonna talk about what cache poisoning is and how you can find it. Then I'll demonstrate cache poisoning on a bunch of well-known websites uh, and show what goes wrong and what goes well. And then I'll also do a live demo on a very well-known piece of software uh, and talk about how not to get your cache poisoned. And then finally wrap up and take five minutes of questions. So, first of all, a bit of context as to this presentation. In this presentation, I'm not gonna be talking about browser cache poisoning. Browsers have built-in caches, these are client-side caches, and from a security point of view, from a cache poisoning point of view, they're not that interesting, so I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about server-side caches. Also, web cache poisoning is not web cache deception. Web cache deception is a really cool technique that was, uh, there was, there was a Black Hat presentation on it last year, and it's about tricking caches into storing sensitive information belonging to users so that the attacker can get access to it. Web cache poisoning is about using caches to save malicious payloads so those payloads get served up to other users. So it's kind of related but the inverse, and the way you exploit them and find them is completely different. Also, this is not about web cache poisoning using response splitting or request smuggling. These are both cool techniques that will get you cache poisoning in the right circumstances, uh, but a lot of the time they don't really work and they're not the topic of this presentation. Finally, and most importantly, 
practical web cache poisoning is not theoretical. Every example I'm using in this entire presentation is based on a real system that I've proven can be exploited using this technique. So, first let's take a very quick look at how caching is supposed to work. Here, we've got three users fetching the same resource one after the other. This resource might be an image or a JavaScript file or even just a HTML web page. And when the cache sees this resource being fetched for the first time, it saves a local copy of it, which means it can then serve that copy up to other users without having to communicate with the backend server, which speeds the website up uh, and everyone's happy. Our objective with web cache poisoning is to send a request to the server that causes a harmful, malicious response to come back to me, and then we want the cache to save that and serve it up to other users. The first step to achieving this is to ask the question, how does the cache know that those first three users are all fetching the same resource? It can't be doing a full-on byte-by-byte comparison on, the, on, the, on their HTTP requests, because HTTP requests are full of all kinds of junk. For example, if those users had different web browsers, the user agent header would be different, so the caching wouldn't really work. Caches address this problem with the concept of cache keys. They say, we only care about certain parts of the, of the request, generally just the host header and the request line. So this is all that the cache does a comparison of to work out if two requests are accessing the same resource. And that's all well and good, uh, but it leads us on to the next question, which is, well, what happens if there's something important and it's not included in the cache key? This is where things start to get interesting. So here we have two requests <clears throat> to the same website, to the same URL, to retrieve a white paper, but one of them is trying to fetch it in English, and the other one is trying to fetch it in Spanish, thanks to this language cookie. And that's absolutely fine, and that will work just great until you put a cache in front of this website. Uh, once, you do, once you do that, it will break because the cookie header is not part of the default cache key, and so the cache is completely oblivious to this language cookie. And that means that if the English user were to fetch this white paper first, they would accidentally poison the cache with the English version of the white paper, and all the users of other languages would end up receiving the white paper in English. And by itself, well, obviously that's just a harmless nuisance this is the behavior that we're going to turn to our advantage. In effect, everything that's not part of the cache key is part of the cache poisoning attack surface. So how do you find cache poisoning? Well, the first step is to identify an unkeyed input. So probably a HTTP header or a cookie, and uh, I'm releasing the tool ParamMiner as an open source tool that works in the pro and free versions of Burp, uh, so everyone can just run that tool and that will hopefully do a decent job of finding some unkeyed inputs on your site. Once you've found the input, the next step is to work out if you can do anything interesting with it. If genuinely all you can do with this input is change the language, like in the example I just showed you, well, 